Are you curious about the newest weight loss medications taking the world by storm? In this episode of our podcast, we take a deep dive into GLP-1 receptor agonists, otherwise known as Ozempic or semaglutide, and Monjaro and Terzapeptide. With obesity rates on the rise, there's a growing need for effective weight loss solutions, and these medications are quickly becoming a popular choice. Join us as we explore the science behind these medications, their potential benefits, and how they're changing the landscape of weight loss treatment. I'm thrilled to welcome Caleb Greer to the show today. As a nurse practitioner with a focus on neuroscience, functional medicine, and integrative psychiatry, Caleb has a wealth of knowledge and experience in the field of weight loss and metabolic health. He has helped over a thousand individuals optimize their function through a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach that integrates neurology, psychology, epigenetics, nutrition, biomechanics, and medicine. Caleb is passionate about restoring the philosophical components of health and well-being, emphasizing the disciplines that lead to a greater understanding of the self. Join us as we learn from his expertise and insights on these groundbreaking weight loss medications. So welcome, Caleb. Hi, thanks for having me, Karen. Yeah. So how was that bio? Because I told Caleb before recording that I shortened his bio up. <laughs> Artfully done. I think uh, Caleb is a nurse practitioner, which has been just fine. <laughs> well, you have, you're a man of many talents, which I was also saying to you, you aren't just into the weight loss and metabolic health. You're doing a lot around the neuroscience um, I see on your Instagram page, which I recommend everybody um following Caleb on his Instagram because he's starting to put out more and more videos I've noticed yeah. and you had a latest one actually on ketamine but how so how do you go from like that was obviously your main focus and then how did these weight loss drugs become such a big part of your practice because it sounds like it is I don't know could I I might be wrong but <laughs> Yeah, you know, so it's even kind of stepping it back from from weight loss, you know, most of the clinical question that I wanted to answer was how to get people as healthy as possible. So even when people weren't um, overweight or obese, but still had metabolic issues, especially with, you know, postmenopausal transitions, when women are used to being, you know, fit and um, operating at a certain level of intensity, um, going through menopause and then finding out even with hormone replacement that, hey, why am I putting this new tire on my waist? I haven't done anything different. I'm not doing anything quote unquote wrong. Um, so really in service of those women, because most of my population actually started as women because the, um, the postmenopausal population was served, um, so poorly, I, yes, I think um, still is. That, yeah. Um, that, you know, they, they came kind of in droves after they started recommending me to their friends and their family members, once they got their, their symptoms and complaints under control, mm -hmm. but from, from clinical neuroscience into medicine, um, with that kind of integrated medicine focus, I mean, obviously you just can't ignore cardiometabolic health. It's, it's still, you know, the number one killer as far as you know, heart disease is concerned, but even bridging into diabetes and metabolic syndrome um, and just obesity in general. So as a, as a, as a clinical problem, I just sought out, you know, four, four years ago to kind of figure out, well, what do we have available aside from stimulants and aside from different things to just kind of increase metabolic rate in the short term that weren't doing many things in the long term for, for health because the weight gain, you know, comes back so much. And, you know, I stumbled across first one was, you know, exenatide and liraglutide and saxenda, which is still liraglutide. Um, and so playing with those personally, you know, I had a great um, response to those kind of during COVID when all the gyms closed and we had no access to, um, to, to wait. So I kind of took a personal journey through using the GLP-1 class to kind of rid myself of extra, extra fat tissue while I didn't have access to the gyms anyway. And so I went through this big catabolic program um, and, and really kind of validated that, hey, this stuff really works, even for someone who's not, you know, exactly obese or overweight. Mm -hmm. um, and then that kind of catapulted the next program as far as, okay, so if we're going to go catabolic and, and lose all this weight, how do we then prevent lean mass loss during that program? And then how do we add more afterwards when the frame is actually lighter and the musculoskeletal system is more resilient to begin with? 
Yes. Oh, see, and that's, I love that your experience has really been around menopausal and perimenopausal women because none of the research has been done on a group of ladies, right? It's all been on type two diabetes and obese patients. And nobody's talking about, well, what about the women that, like you said, they were fit, they, you know, didn't have a problem with weight. And then they've hit menopause and they've done everything right still, you know, they're replacing their hormones, they're still eating right, exercising. And there's still a large group of them that still can't get that menopausal weight gain off. First off, why do you think that is? Like when somebody's replace giving back their body, what it's missing and what caused the weight gain, you give them back the hormones, you optimize the hormones, they feel fantastic. You know that all their symptoms are gone as far as like the mental stuff and the hot flashes and they feel good, but yet the, the weight won't budge. Do you have any theories behind why that is? I mean, I think it's just more of the orchestra that we can't replace. You know, I mean, so we can we can do as much as we can to change numbers and to change symptoms. But the way that, you know, the brain and the ovaries and the adrenals and all those systems talk, we just we can't we can't mimic that. And I think when it comes to how the brainstem then kind of orchestrates all the gastric release of peptides and so forth that regulate satiety and energy expenditure. We also have to combat with the idea that, you know, once you get to that age, you know, reproductively we're not fit anymore, even, even as, you know, men, you know, in their fifties and sixties. So the, the genetic programming just kind of starts to, I mean, I don't want to use the word dissolve because it's not really technically accurate, but you know, it just kind of starts to, to decay because we're trying to make room for the next generations to actually take our place. So in lieu of having a greater lifespan, you know, the, the increased need for a health span is, is kind of right behind it. So, you know, to answer your question fully, I don't know why mm -hmm. you can't lose that, that extra weight, even though everything is kind of um, back to baseline. Now, when I, when I help people go through pre to peri to post and replace through that whole cycle, the weight loss actually doesn't really happen. I mean, the weight gain doesn't really happen. So if you yes. catch it ahead of time and kind of keep the orchestra working before it kind of crumbles to the ground, then there's actually a, a pretty good population that, that I've used as a, um, as a resource to kind of show that, look, that that's not always going to happen. Yeah. But then I find perimenopausal women are being told by their doctors and even their functional practitioners, things like, Ooh, don't, don't replace your hormones until you're in menopause, you know, danger, danger. And it's like, no, why are we waiting for women to be 20 pounds overweight, a hot mess? And now you can have the estrogen that you're missing. Now you can have your testosterone. That makes no sense. But that seems to be the general consensus out there. Even with hormone doctors, they're like, no, 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 let's not give anything until you're well into menopause or, or in menopause, which is a year after you've stopped. And, and all the side effects start way before that happens. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, if women could come in when they're in their, you know, late thirties, early forties, perfect. Mm -hmm. No, agreed. And, you know, it's, it's, it's harder, you know, I think because in that perimenopausal transition, they're having periods every three or four months, or, you know, they'll go 11 months and have a period and they miss that, that one year mark. And they're yeah. not, <laughs> so dumb. Anymore. but you know, their, their blood levels are, they're, they're un, they're untrackable. I mean, as far as like, you just can't predict it. And so you know, for the most part, my first intervention is typically um, progesterone, still luteal phase only, even when they're perimenopausal, just to kind of mimic yep. as much as possible. Um, you know, but then I say, look out for vaginal dryness, look out for the estrogen withdrawal symptoms, the crepey skin, the hair loss, all that kind of stuff. And then we'll start doing estrogen, lower doses, maybe just kind of the first few days of the follicular phase. But, you know, it just takes a much more nuanced approach. And I think you know, in my practice, since my lines of communication are so open that we can actually go through those um, transitions much quicker and much more efficiently because we course correct almost every week. And so without that kind of communication, it becomes really difficult for someone to monitor and prescribe the program. And so then they're just liable for the, for the defeat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's jump into these two 
you know, weight loss drugs that are literally taking the world by storm right now. It's crazy. Like I hear pharmacies are running out of them. It's like the Kardashians are doing them. It's like, everybody's like, get me on these. Uh, so we've, we've originally had semaglutide and now since last year we've in, in the States, not in Canada, we've got terzapeptide. So can you explain the difference between the two, first of all? Sure. Yeah. So semaglutide or Ozempic and Wegovy, both the same drug, is a pure GLP-1 agonist. So it has no other activity except for glucagon-like one peptide. Uh, Munjaro and trisepatide, on the other hand, is a dual increase. It's still one molecule, but it has activity at both the glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide receptor, which is one incretin, and the GLP-1 receptor also. One of the main differences, though, also is that terzepatide has a much lower potency at the GLP-1 receptor. And so while that might seem like a, a, um, a downside, it's actually an upside because with semaglutide, the way that receptor trafficking works when you have a high potency agonist is that the cells will actually start to involute the receptors. And so you don't actually translate as much of the signal. So that's why people generally, I think, I'm, I'm hypothesizing here, that they have to keep escalating their dose to the point where it actually doesn't work anymore. And so then they'll either transition off to terzepatide or something different. But with terzepatide, I haven't seen that resistance really grow. And that's because there is documented less returnal or less internal um, disintegration of those receptors that can then still be available to be stimulated from the lower potency terzepatide. So when you, when you say this, like, just to put it in, you know, let's dummy it down a little bit, Caleb, <laughs> you're the receptors, you get receptor fatigue, basically, or receptor saturation. Is that what, or down regulation of the receptors? Yep. So they get saturated. And then the response to that saturation is down regulation. Right. Which can also happen with hormones as well. When you replace your hormones, we can start to see this down regulation of the receptors as well. So people will say, oh, I felt so great in the beginning. And then they don't feel so good anymore, which is why it's important to kind of cycle on and off sometimes with certain, certain hormones I find more so than others, but I don't know what you find. Yeah. Okay. So the terzepatide, it sounds to be like, to me, like it's the better of the two, but one not available in Canada, you can get it shipped, um, from the States, but very expensive, uh, and in the States, from my understanding, and cor please correct me if I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong, you cannot get it compounded, legally compounded. Like it has to be Manjaro. Mm, kind of. So the, the difficulty with these drugs, especially when they're in a shortage, is that compounding pharmacies can make a unique and distinct product that's different in the dosing and the concentration that has you know, something else like BPC or B6 or B12. Um, and still be able to produce it. That being said, it's still within the pharmaceutical company's right to send a cease and desist if they find out people that are making their product off patent. Is that the patent. same then for semaglutide? Yes and no. I think the patent on semaglutide is more of the actual um, methodology of, of the synthesis or with the delivery in, a, in an auto injector or something else like that. I think there's a few different um, patents around it, but essentially it makes it to where the synthesis is a gray area at, um, at the least. Yeah. Cause I was told by the compounding pharmacy, which is a really big compounding pharmacy in the States that they can compound semaglutide, but they can't do trisopeptide. They said we, it, it, they're not allowed to, and then it would be like $1,200 a month to get it. So the fact they know how much it would cost might mean that they've actually looked into it and just aren't doing it, but no. So, I mean, I, there's, I think I'm aware of now four that have terzepatide available um, as a compound. Yeah. I've heard, I mean, I've heard of people getting it as a compound. So then I'm like, okay, are these guys just doing it kind of under the table or how is, how are they able to give this out, um, legally, but okay. So the, it's definitely gray area right now. And we're yeah, kind I of mean, waiting. It's, it's one of those things, you know, I typically prescribe the actual, you know, pharmaceutical number one, because insurances will cover it for the people that are indicated for, 
but when it is compounded, you know, it's just kind of one of those things we tell people, Hey, this might not always be around. Um, so we can use it while we have it, but just kind of like with HCG and some of the other things that fell off the table when the FDA removed them as biologics, it was just like a, you know, we had it good for a little bit and now we don't, or we have to go source it somewhere else. Which brings me to a question, actually, have you ever combined HCG and a GLP-1? No, I mean, a lot of the men that I have on, you know, testosterone or hormone optimization take um, HCG. HCG and they're on a GLP-1 or, or a dual, you know, twin cretin, but um, it doesn't speed up the weight loss in the same way that like using the HCG diet does. Okay. I was thinking, I wonder how it, my, I know that my naturopath said that she's done it before where, because it is a good, it was a good weight loss regime, the HCG diet. Like I did see people getting really like lasting results from it and it worked and it seemed to really target the biggest fat air, fatty areas. And then they could create a new set point. And if they ate well, it would stay there. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't getting rebound weight gain unless they went back to eating eating like an asshole, like my friend Pam says, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, it just, I thought, wow, if you could put those two together so that you would maybe not have the rebound weight gain coming off of this, of the GLP ones, I thought, oh, I wonder if that could work to just kind of have a better set point on your new weight once you come off it. Well, let's just talk about that. I mean, as mm -hmm. far as the rebound weight goes, I mean, I think when we take the data from those, um, those trials that trisepatide was used, and even, and even with Semex, I don't think that there's been a reanalysis of the data to follow up on the people that did the Munjaro as far as their weight gain after stopping. Okay. Um, some of, we definitely have that data that basically everyone gained it back after a year of stopping it. So more of the question, especially within my population is, you know, am I going to gain this weight back after I stop? And, yeah. you know, my typical answer is mm, maybe. But if you're doing all the right things in the meantime, like if you use that time while you're actually appetite suppressed and, you, and you're not having the food noise, you don't have the cravings to get your shit in order, right? To get your exercise, to get your sleep, to get your nutrition kind of dialed in, then the likelihood that you will fall off the tracks once your metabolism is squared away is a lot less likely. Now, most people do get their hunger back within probably two, two months after stopping, but they still get satiety way quicker. Oh, right. I didn't know that. Their hunger will be there. And, and even personally speaking, you know, I'll be just as hungry as, you know, when I was um, normally, but I can't put as way as much food as I would have before taking it. Right. So wow. the, um, the stomach sensitivity and the stretch sensitivity and the satiety mechanism still seem to hold even after you stop taking it. Hmm. Now, I will say, you know, even for people that stop altogether, it's still a tool in their toolkit to use. Um, around times of plenty, right? So Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, all these different get togethers that, you know, food is just widely available and it's typically not the greatest choices. Um, you know, so they'll kind of dose up three or four weeks beforehand to make sure that everything is kind of um, all right and their ducks are in a row before they get exposed to all these triggers that would otherwise kind of make them fall into their habits that they wouldn't want to indulge in. Have you seen in your practice uh, the best way to come off of it and main, like besides obviously continuing eating well, exercising, you got all the lifestyle factors in there, but is there a best way to kind of come off of it where maybe you would wean down and get that set point of your new weight in place um, rather than just hopping right off once you reach that goal weight? Not necessarily. So I think what's been most beneficial is just stopping a cold turkey and allowing your system to kind of reset itself, feeling what that's like, and then seeing if it changes the body composition, right? So then, you know, we'll do baseline scans, mid, mid, um, mid program scans and final scans, and then they'll be out on their own in the wild for a few months and they'll come back and we'll rescan and see, okay, well, how well did you adhere to your program and what's the, uh, what's the outcome? And we'll be able to see you put that fat back, you put more lean mass on, you lost lean mass, you lost fat mass and put a number to it. So generally speaking, when people go cold turkey, they do just fine. You know, as long as they keep everything up, their metabolism still stays high. They're still kind of able to reduce their total caloric intake um, because their satiety measures are better. They're still sleeping better. They're still exercising. They have their energy. They're obviously carrying around less weight because they've lost it. 
Um, so they're just able to function. They're happier. They have better motivation to keep doing the things that they've been doing. Um, and then if they need to kind of go back on, they say, okay, look, you know, in the last month I've gained, you know, two or three pounds back. I'm kind of worried about it. What should we do? And I'm like, well, you know, have a metric, you know, figure out what you're doing and we'll see, run another two weeks. If the number keeps climbing, then we might restart at the lowest dose just to kind of keep um, the GLP-1 and the GIP saturation a little bit higher. Mm-hmm. The other way to do it is decrease the dose and just maintain at, you know, a 2.5 or a five milligram dose, spread out the uh, injection frequency. So instead of doing it every week, do it every two weeks, every three weeks, just kind of fit what it is in their lifestyle that they would like to do. Because a lot of it's about opportunity costs, right? What are you missing out on by stopping this drug? What are you missing out on by continuing the drug? And so when we have that conversation, most people are like, you know, it's easy, it's covered, I can afford it. Why would I not? I mean, in terms of the long-term benefit that we've been seeing with cardiometabolic um, benefit, it's kind of a no-brainer. I have. Uh, that's how I felt about it. I was like, if I have to be on a drug for the rest of my life to keep slim, bring it on. <laughs> that, that that's a safe drug. It's not something that's gonna you know destroy my health in the meantime. It looks like it has other benefits to it. I've got a history of Alzheimer's in my family and I know it's good for that. So I was like, yeah, if I had to like take a, a maintenance shot once a month or something or every couple of weeks, I, to me, that was like, yeah, I mean, why, why not? I mean, yeah. considering how much we battle this in our lives, it's, you know, I don't know, no brainer. Yeah. And again, you know, with, with the things in our environment that we have, cravings for across the board like the hedonistic aspects of consumption also go down across the board so people that have trouble with alcohol people that have trouble with with um gambling with shopping with with all these different little minor addictions also seem to get better and so if we're raising the global uh, mental health mental health you know that's also an added benefit to using the drug I think where most people come into this argument as um, as an anti-advocate is where discipline has a role, right? So people from the outside looking in are like, well, why can't you just eat less? Why oh, can't you why can't- punch those people's, people in the face? <laughs> we also have to be you know, sensitive to them too because they haven't had that experience. They haven't yeah. treated them. They don't know what it's like to be on that side of the boat. So it takes kind of a calm collective voice to say, have you thought about this in a different manner? Like you, you're not that person. You've been blessed with a great discipline. Good for you. Not everyone has that. Um, or we've got people that are super disciplined that are still way overweight. You know, cardiac yes. that's great. Nothing to uh, nothing to remark on. And why? There's no good reason except for their metabolism is working against them. Yeah, and I I specialize in women's weight loss resistance because of my history is of that, like where I was working out, I was eating perfectly, and I just was getting fatter and fatter and fatter. And I could have gone down to 500 calories, I probably did, and not not one pound would come off me. And I was like, okay, what's going on here? Like this yeah. is ser- serious weight loss resistance. And then that took me in this direction. But so it's good that it all happened. And now I can help those women that everybody's like, oh, sure, you're just in your closet eating cookies and cakes at nighttime and you're yeah. full of crap or whatever. Right. And it's like, no, there are, it's a growing issue more and more and more, especially women are having weight loss resistance when they are doing everything right. And it really kicks into high gear when they start losing their hormones in midlife. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to what it's doing to our brain, when you talk about how it can help with these addictions and it, and it reacts on the pleasure centers of the brain, what is that doing? Is it reacting on our dopamine? Is it increasing dopamine, decreasing serotonin? Like what's it involve exactly? So the, the trajectory is kind of through... So the GLP-1 receptors are on some of the brainstem nuclei that have inputs into the hypothalamus and into the ventral tegmental area, which has the dopaminergic neurons um, there. So as far as the reward signaling goes, um, I don't think it's exactly mapped out, but what it seems to do again is just reduce the reduce the cue of food intake 
or you know, consumatory behavior with a opioidergic and a dopaminergic response. So it's it's not really anything to do with, and it could be, you know, this is again really a novel space in, in terms of what this drug is doing. Um, but through the melanocortin receptors and through the other receptors that have to do with um, you know, the, the transcript, like cocaine and amphetamine related transcript, you've got the agouti related peptides, all these different things that are very fundamentally associated with survival and mm -hmm. with energy expenditure, they feed forward into the motor nuclei of the, you know, the dorsal vagus and the parabrachial nucleus and the, and the nucleus tractus solitarius. So all these different structures that are, that are involved with basically food aversion with the autonomic nervous system output and with reward signaling, food craving, motivation, incentive reward, and consumatory reward all kind of have a break where they can reestablish and re, um, reappropriate the behaviors that should be done for survival versus for, um, I guess, just for hedonism, right? Yeah, for, for, yeah. for safety, for security, for coping, for strategies of basically dealing with stressors that can't be dealt with in any other way, except for quick fixes. Right. And because our brain can't distinguish between survival mechanisms and like when they need to be in place rather than we're in 2023 here where we don't have, you know, we're not starving in, in North America in most cases, and we've got all this abundance of food and our brain can't really go, Oh, we don't need to be hedonistic anymore for survival. You know, does that make sense? <laughs> like, is that what you were saying? Like your brain can't go in between those two? Um, not so much. It kind of just shuts off that. It kind of just shuts off that, that desire for something that has been lacking. So in terms of, um, let's just say someone who really enjoys sugar and that's yes. kind of, or, or wine even actually, I think wine's a better um, avenue. So someone goes home, it's the end of the day. They they want to relax. They have their bottle or they have their glass of <laughs> bottle of wine. They have their glass of wine. <laughs> Probably a bottle. <laughs> and you know they come in. They say, "Yeah, I have a glass of wine every night with dinner, and it's no big deal." And and so forth. It's like, well, why is it that you can walk into your home and immediately feel like you're gonna just run this game path to the liquor cabinet to grab your bottle of wine to pour your glass, and that's just like the ritual. Like you don't even know what you're doing um, consciously. And so what the drug tends to do is actually make you more conscious of all your decisions because you're not craving those things. So you, it's like you have more time available in your day to actually think about stuff. Interesting. So you walk in the door, you're thinking, okay, I usually walk in the door and I go to my cabinet and I get the wine. But right now I'm not even thinking about that, right? It doesn't even register, right? So the same thing with food, like they're going to be in front of the fridge and they're like, usually I open the doors two or three times a night and I look for the, for, for what I want to have in this fridge. But that thought doesn't even kind of register. And so you're kind of set with more time to do things that would otherwise be distracted by consumatory behaviors. And so this is when I tell people like, look, if you have a coping strategy that this medication removes or at least diminishes, you're going to have to deal with the fallout of actually not having those strategies to increase your, you know, short circuited dopamine release. So then that's where people actually complain of, Hey, I feel a bit depressed um, on these drugs. I feel a little bit, you know, sad or just kind of like, I don't want to do much. And it's because it kind of reduces that tonic level of dopamine. That's just sitting in the brain, ready to kind of respond to things that are rewarding or to avoid things that are punishing. Um, that's, that's so a, that's so fascinating. So I have a question from a, a family member actually who I was saying telling her about this drug because she has sugar addiction. She has no weight to lose, but she has severe sugar addiction. Like she should weigh 300 pounds, but she was very tiny. She's very wiry, doesn't put on any weight, doesn't matter how much she eats. Um but can't stop the sugar. And I was like, maybe you should use just like a low dose of this stuff because it really, when I was on it for the month that I was on it, it killed my sugar cravings. Like I wanted nothing to do with high sweet foods at all. And she was like, so she's asking, how does it work? And I was telling her that it does react on these pleasure centers of the brain. And I couldn't feel, I said, I don't understand it, but 
it, it does really help with things like alcoholism and addictive behavior. And she said, well, would it affect my sex drive? And I was like, oh, I didn't even think about that. She said, because that's all around the same areas of the brain, your sexual pleasure and sex drive. She said, would it dull that? And I was like, ooh, I don't know. So do you find? It's tricky. <clears throat> so with, with sex drive in particular, it, it won't reduce libido. For someone who's in a monogamous relationship that has the same sexual partner and there's not as much novelty anyway, it doesn't impact that. I haven't seen it impact the, the those kinds of relationships. For for the more free types, I would say, you know, for the more um, promiscuous types that have more partners or just kind of enjoy more of an actual, you know, dating life and have, you know, that underpinning, that is actually going to be reduced. So it's going to be less rewarding to actually seek um, a new date. It's going to be less rewarding to get those swipes. It's going to be less rewarding to actually get all those little cues that mean there's a reward kind of dangling in front of you because it's not as rewarding anymore. And so people tend to think about reward as the actual end game. It's the pursuit that drives the dopaminergic stimulus. So it's, it's more of the harbinger that there's a reward close that gets diminished. And so if there's less seeking drive overall, then you're less likely to succumb to these pathways that have already been grained out um, and, and pursue them. So for someone who has a, a bent towards that phenotype that I just discussed, they will likely find themselves probably going out less, engaging in less encounters, and actually kind of being less um, driven to do those things in general. So it kind of opens up more time for other things. Like it, it, once again, it's for the people that have a more of an addictive behavior towards it, right? We know that sex can be extremely addictive. So it can, if somebody's kind of got a little too far on the other side of that and they're addicted to the the chase and the swipes, and then it can actually help that behavior, but it won't diminish somebody's drive to have sex with their partner, or it won't like dull an orgasm or anything. I've never heard of that, but. No, I mean, because mostly because orgasm is really less to do with dopamine as much as it is to oxytocin and, and opioids. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, she'll be happy to hear this then. <laughs> That's, that was a burning question. So, okay. Very interesting. So going back to how you know, you're talking about when people, yeah, they do suddenly lose this weight and kind of what it can do to their brain. I was listening to this podcast yesterday about um, gastric bypass surgery. And this is something I didn't know, which is there's a higher risk, like your risk goes up of suicide after gastric bypass surgery, because when people, people think that they're going to lose, once they, once they lose the weight, life is going to be better. They're going to be happier. They're going to be more confident. Everything's going to change. They have this, they lose the weight or a lot of it and their life doesn't change. Their emotions don't get better. And that can cause depression. What have you seen in your practice working with people that have been overweight through their whole life or carry a lot of weight that suddenly lose all of this fat, like what does that do to their identity? And they're like, do people kind of panic and, whoa, I don't like this kind of thing or self-sabotage or anything? Do you see that? No, I mean, honestly, huh? I think there's, when, when people lose weight, the, the biggest feedback from a negative perspective that I get is all my friends and family are worried about me. Oh, right, <laughs> yeah. You know, they weren't worried when you were 200 pounds overweight, but now they're worried that you're a normal BMI. Yeah, that. I, yeah, um, because they're they're typically jealous and be like, think you're doing something wrong. Yeah, I mean, they might have a. a it, it, it's worth being concerned, but then you know, coaching the individual to say, hey, you know, actually, look, you know, I've I've been seeing a provider and we're tracking everything and everything's safe and we're doing everything right and I'm eating more than I was before and I'm having better protein intake and exercising now and I feel good. My knees don't hurt. I can walk my dog without, you know, being in pain. So, you know, by and large, most people are definitely, you know, I'd say everyone's happy unless they're vomiting. Right. Um, but as, as far as the emotional changes in sense of self, I would say most people don't see themselves as their fat self. Right. Yeah. Right? Most people are going to say, 
this is what I used to be. This is when I felt my best when I was in college and I was playing these sports. Then I had my kids. Then I met my husband, you know, whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> Life just gets in the way. And then they wake up one day and like, who am I? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just was speaking with somebody yesterday that's going to do it. And uh, that's, she said, you know, she started crying. It was so sad. Cause she said, I don't, I look, I get out of the shower and I look at myself and I'm like, who is that person? She's like, I've put on so much weight. And she's like, I can't, I can't even recognize the person I've seen in the mirror. And I was like, oh, that's heartbreaking. And I get that. Like I've gone through those phases in my life where it's just been like, who is this in this body? This is not who I am. It's not how I see myself in my brain. So that's really good to hear because I would think that there would be some issues around that. Because I do see it in my practice just when women lose weight that have always been heavy, that there is this resistance to it because they've thought nothing but about their weight, you know, 90% of the day, every day for 40 years then suddenly they don't have that to think about anymore. And it does rock the boat a little bit. Yeah. Well, and that's also kind of planning ahead of time. Like, Hey, what are you going to do when you feel good again? Like what's your goal with being at a lighter physique, right? What are you going to do next? Are you going to pick up a hobby? Are you going to go do the things that you did before that you would like to do again? Um, yeah. Same sense as what their coping strategies are. Right. So this is where the mental health side of my practice really kicks in because setting up expectations and, and understanding, you know, what people actually want, what they desire, and how they get those things are going to be needed to be laid out. Otherwise, you know, if you don't have a if you don't have an aim, you're going to miss one hundred percent of the time. Yeah, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? Right, <laughs> Tony Robbins. I think that's Tony Robbins. <laughs> you want to have a note that is uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. What about the, so I get a lot of pushback as far as the bad side effects go where people are, I had somebody write me and say, what about this thyroid cancer? And, you know, there's this black box warning on it that says, you know, if you've had this rare thyroid cancer, do not take this drug, but yet it's never been replicated in humans. So are, have you seen anything as far as like that thyroid cancer goes and what do you know about it? Like, is that true that it's, it's never been replicated in humans? Yes. So that's true. I mean, I would say that if, if someone has had that form of cancer, that's probably a bad idea and I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, but I've had no, no clients ever with, you know, medullary thyroid cancer. That being said, um, a couple of people that I had on semaglutide did develop some dysphagia, right? Some trouble swallowing because of some swelling in their thyroid gland, um, that resolved after they stopped taking it. Uh, so that was interesting, but then, you know, they took about a month off and they restarted it and it, it didn't have a problem again. So it could have been, you know, related, or it could have been unrelated just with something else, but definitely something that I took note of to, to kind of advise people, Hey, if you have any issues with, you know, feeling like your throat's getting swollen or, or sore, you know, let me know and we'll troubleshoot. Do you, do you take thyroid labs before and after on people when, when they're on this? And do you see it raising reverse T3 or lowering um, T3, pre T3? Sometimes it will raise reverse T3 and lower T3 if they're not eating enough carbohydrate. Oh, so if they're doing more lower, cause I had, oh, I had one client who she was Hashimoto's and her reverse T3 had gone up from going on it, but it, it wasn't affecting her, which I thought was interesting. Like she was, she still felt amazing and she wasn't getting hypo symptoms, but it had been flagged. It had gone up. And I said, well, let's just wait because I bet you it's going to come down really quickly now that you're off of it. And it did. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, really, and, and I tell people, from a metabolic flexibility perspective, like when they get on these things to kind of just not think about how they thought about food in the past kind of couple of years, as far as the keto and, and kind of high fat, low carbohydrate diets are concerned. Now, obviously if they're diabetic, that's a different com- conversation, but you know, if they're insulin sensitive and they have, you know, decent triglyceride levels and everything else to kind of indicate that they're insulin sensitive, I tell them like carbohydrates are going to be your friend. Yeah. Yeah. They were really my friend. It just for the month that I was on it, I wanted nothing super sweet, but I wanted to eat a lot of just complex carbs. I wanted the potato, sweet potato fruits. Like, and usually I'm not, I don't lean that far. Like I'm not super low carb or anything. I don't, I don't like keto, but still I found that 
I wanted to eat more of the carbs. And that would just, that all makes total sense because the research shows us just normally, if you're eating a ketogenic diet long-term, you're, especially for women, reverse T3 goes up and free T3 goes down. So I see that often. Same, very often. Yeah. And people are, women are affecting their hormones when they're doing it too long because of that, like not just the thyroid. So that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> I have people that want to do keto, they're taking T3. Oh, really? Yes. See, that's smart. Yeah. Because, and it just drives me nuts when you hear these keto doctors saying, yes, your free T3 will go down, but it just means you're just functioning better. And I'm like, um, yeah, it's tell this to the woman who's losing her hair, can't sleep, is suddenly gaining weight when she's on this very low carb, no carb diet and her free T3 is in the toilet and her reverse T3 is up. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't fight me on that one. <laughs> I don't like that. Not one bit. Where clinical practice has a huge edge. What's that? So that's where clinical practice has a huge edge. Yes, absolutely. Uh, when, as far as the weight rebound goes, what are you seeing in your practice as like percentage wise? Like, do you find like 50% of women will keep the weight off if they're doing everything right? Or especially for the perimenopausal menopausal women, because I know that all my listeners are like, tell me more about that because they're all asking me, am I going to just gain this weight back if I start doing this drug? So, you know, I'll kind of qualify this with two different populations. So most women don't come off of it. So I'll, that that's the first. Okay. The lower the dose, though, they'll, they'll kind of increase the, the dosing frequency in between, or they'll yeah. they'll reduce the frequencies. They'll go to every two weeks, every three weeks, but they typically stay on it. Okay. For the women that have either because they couldn't get it under the coupon program anymore, or didn't want to purchase the compounded version, they went off of it. Let's just say so. On average, if they lost, let's just say thirty pounds, they might gain a sixth of that back. Right. So they'll kind of still gravitate. They'll still be happy, but they'll notice that they, Hey, I put on five or six pounds. It's still staying there. It's not going more than that, but I'm, I don't like it. Right. So now, once they know that their number can be lower, they're kind of um, disappointed, but also all the tools that I have available, we, we make up for it in different ways. So if they want to get off the Munjaro, you know, they come use the ARX machines, they get more skeletal muscle mass. You know, they do the ice bath, they do the red lights, they do the emerald laser. There's, there's a ton of different tools that we have available besides the GLP-1 GIP class that help keep weight off if they do want to come off. Okay, great. That is that is exactly what I have seen so far. And I haven't used it long enough in my practice to get a lot of you know people coming off of it yet. Most of them are still on it. But the ones that I have seen come off of it, I they've said that they, a couple pounds come on. And then same thing, they're like... Yeah, I'm just gonna go back on it. <laughs> I just want to keep it keep it going down, not going up. So, so I haven't really been able to see long term um, if it if it remains there. You know, if it's just a couple pound re weight regain and then it stops, which I think it's normal because a lot of that would probably be a little bit of water retention, a little bit of rebalance, and then it could stop. I think, especially if you have your hormones in place. Like, do you find that? Do you use a lot of that in combination with hormone therapy? like the semaglutide and HRT? Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. pretty much, I mean, I, I pluck low-hanging fruit first, and that's generally hormone replacement, especially for someone who's in menopause. Um, so we kind of see what we get first, make sure everything's kind of squared away, because obviously adding to his appetite is going to mess with things. Um, I also find, you know, this is interesting too, that I do usually have to address the estrogen dosing on women that lose weight because of the adipose generation of estrogen goes down. Yes. I didn't even think about that. That it makes might sense. Start to notice like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting, my, my boobs are getting swole or, you know, I'm starting to get some swelling in my feet and ankles. Um, and it sounds like they're just getting too much estrogen. And yeah. so it's the dose. I'm like, all right, well, you know, you just lost 20 pounds of fat. So your, your little estrogen factories are reducing too. Yes. Yes. And what about using, cause there's muscle, there's the fear is muscle wasting. There was some research done on, on the use of these drugs and how a lot of people will lose a lot of muscle. So sarcopenia. And I always tell my clients, okay, you've got to use, you know, a good protein powder, you know, you've got to use some amino acids, like things like this, but what about using things like 
like in conjunction with those things, um, testosterone or oxandrolone for the muscle wasting, just to help preserve the muscle while they're on it. So women, I typically don't give more testosterone just because, you know, so <laughs> women still generally make as much testosterone as they did pre-menopause, post-menopause. It just happens from the adrenal glands and in the tissues themselves from DHEA. So as long as they have enough DHEA, I'm more likely to actually supplement with DHEA and things like Toncat or Sustanch to increase their testosterone and then use something like a low dose antibar. Oh, you do, eh? Okay. Like when you say low dose, like 10, 12 milligrams? Like five or six and a half twice a day. Mm. And do you find that that just, a little, this is not on the topic, but do you find that that helps to reduce uh, SHBG? Oh, for sure. That's part of the, yeah, that's, that's a hundred percent part of the reason. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, cause I like it for that. It's like, it really does reduce SHBG for women that are on thyroid medication and their all their hormones are getting bound up because of it, which nobody talks about that, but that's, I know that's another conversation, but okay. So you use a little bit of both. I find I'll have to say that, I mean, I have been doing this for a very long time. I find it's 50, 50, 50% of women seem to lose their testosterone. 50% don't Yeah, it's, in it's, menopause. It's typically driven. I mean, I have some women that are, you know, super lean their whole lives. They're the ones that need testosterone after yes. this is used to a higher amount, both ovarian and adrenal production for the women that are kind of heavier breasted or just kind of thicker in nature and have more of an estrogen or progesterone dominance testosterone typically tips the scales over towards estrogen anyway, because they have the endogenous aromatization. So, you know, it's just, everyone's a trial basis. Yeah. And, and oxandrolone anavar doesn't convert to estrogen. So it's, if, if you are that person that goes far way into that estrogen pathway, that can be a good alternative to testosterone so that you're not producing more estrogen. Now I'll typically give women maca with Anivar just because their estrogen does tend send like does tend to go down a bit too much. Um, so if they start getting hot flashes, if they start you know losing their period in perimenopause, you know if they start kind of seemingly transitioning early, then I'll add the maca and see if we can get their um, their menstrual cycle back online. Oh, that's a good idea. Do you use feminescence, hmm. maca? Yeah, me too. It's the best. Okay. What about combining other medications for people that are, there is a small percentage of people that are non-responders. I would say, I don't know if I was a non-responder. I had a hor I got horrible migraines from, from using it. You were the oh, only cool. person that had an answer to that. Yeah. CGRPs. Yes. So why was that again? Like, I can't remember. I, I was the one that posted it on Nat's forum and you were the only one that actually had an answer to it. Did you try it? We don't have them in Canada. We have the like Imgality and those, the harsher ones. We don't have like Nurtec or is that what it's called? Nurtec? And Nurtec, the one there. that you could just take as, as needed. Like I didn't want to start Im Imgality because A, you gain lots of weight from it and you have to stay on that. It's a shot every three months or something. And I was like, oh, that makes me too nervous. So, um, yeah. I thought, oh, if I could get the Nurtec, then I could just take it as needed. So have you found that other migrainers are having problems with it? So if someone has migraines and I give them this med, I give them Nurtec ahead of time. You do. Okay. Is it expensive in the States if you don't have insurance? Probably. I would think so. Because I could get it out of the States if I wanted. Um, we we have a really good sample program with them. So for people that can't afford it, we can get it pretty, pretty well um, covered, if not going through like a specialty pharmacy or something like that. But um, so the reason why though, is because part of the reason that the class as a whole gives you appetite suppression and food aversion is from CGRP. So the increase in CGRP goes up to the brain as a general alarm system to that parabrachial nucleus and basically says, we just ate something or took something that is no bueno, get rid of it. So then you get your, your reflux, you get the nausea, and then you get the potential for, you know, regurgitation um, because of that general alarm signal. And so since Nurtec blocks CGRP or, you know, Mgality, all those different anti-CGRP. Which is calcitonin, right? Calcitonin gene-related peptide. Thank you. Um, 
it can reduce the surge in CGRP, which can kind of mitigate some of those spikes. And since migraine pathology is generally related to, you know, CGRP mediated um, vasodilation and constriction in different areas, that's why. So will it, like the nausea and stuff tends to go away the more you use these drugs. So will the migraines eventually go away? If they're caused by the increase in CGRP from the medication, then yeah. But you still have your own endogenous migraine triggers that will increase CGRP endogenously. Right. Okay. Interesting. All right. Okay. So going back to drugs that we can use alongside of it, I had a couple people write in questions knowing I was going to be talking to you. So uh, things like the growth hormone peptides in combination with the GLPs, how do you find that? good i mean it just gets expensive <laughs> so i, I mean, know right yeah it does <laughs> all things being equal like if you had a testimonial and a combo with trisepatide like that would work synergistically to tackle the visceral fat at the same time that you're getting a lot of the subcutaneous depots um as well as increasing the ghrelin which is going to be inhibited by not having hunger too so you're kind of augmenting a little bit of the appetite um, suppression with uh, with the ghrps uh, but it hasn't been uh, an impact factor for people's appetite suppression okay not too much better growth hormone release despite being you know not eating which is a big signal for growth hormone release right what about using metformin or berberine with it i would think that right. that would maybe lower low blood sugar too much no, no it doesn't fine. lower. Okay. It really it does. I mean, if you're using like 500 or 1,000 milligrams of uh, metformin, basically all that's going to do is inhibit gluconeogenesis from other substrates. Okay, that's all right so then. What I typically do is like I'll use a lot of SGLT2 inhibitors like Farxiga and um, Jardians to increase carbon excretion through the urine. Oh is you'll basically waste an extra four to 500 calories from carbohydrates into your bladder and out through the toilet. Okay. So when people are coming off of terzepatide or when they're on it in, in general, you know, to help ease up their return back to caloric surplus, they will still be a deficit, even if they're eating more. If they're using metformin. The SGLT2 class. Oh, okay. I, I've never heard of those. Okay, cool. They end in flozen. So canagliflozin, dipagliflozin, and pagliflozin. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay. She's had another question. Typical dosage and length of time that you find works best for people that need to lose like 10 to 20 pounds. Like, is it a short stint or do you still find that they stay on, you, you still have them stay on it? So the 10 to 20 pound people generally is actually a longer a longer stint with a lower dose. Oh, and, and you'll just see that that works better. Yeah. Um, cause when someone has a lot to lose, they can kind of fluctuate to a larger degree, but for people that really want to maintain their skin integrity and kind of look good with that 20 pound weight loss, you want to do it over a longer period of time. And so when you would, you would just do a lower dose. Yeah. Like two and a half or five, you know, really don't seem to go higher than that for someone who has so little to lose. And that's on the terzepeptide because semaglutide, isn't it? You just go up to 2.5 is the highest dose. 2.4 is the highest dose. 0.25 is what you start with. Yeah. Um, I would probably try to get them up to one milligram on the Ozempic. Okay. And what about for the non-responders? Have you been able to figure out why that is, or if there's anything that can help non-responders? Like I have a lady in my group and she's been on it for two and a half months or three months She's at 0.5 Ozempic and she hasn't lost any weight. Switch her to Zepatite. <laughs> She's in Canada. Um, <laughs> I've heard you talk about adding in melanotan too. Yeah, but that has its own set of problems. What? I, I, if, if I was going to do a melanocortin for weight loss, it'd be set melanotide first. Set melanotide. Okay just so you avoid the sympathomimetic, like the, the increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Oh, because melanotan too will increase blood pressure. Okay. Which can, would, would that be a problem for somebody that has chronically low blood pressure? Would that be a good thing, man? Yeah. That'd be a good thing. Okay. Because I always have low blood pressure. Do you see <laughs> melanotan too working just by itself for weight loss? 
yeah. for women? You know, to be honest, I haven't used it in very many women for weight loss. So I can't say, but for men, sure. Okay. And what about this, the libido increase? It seems like it, like it, the wording is always a little bit fuzzy where it's like, are you saying that just men get, because they say it helps with erectile dysfunction and it increases libido. And I'm like, so does it increase libido for men and women or just men? I would say it's more potent in women. More potent in women. Cause that could, that's, you know, women are always complaining about their sex drive. So here we've got something that can. If you're going to use that, you, you would go for the PT-141, which is more specific for the arousal centers than uh, the melanotan too. And that's working on the same mechanisms, PT-141? Yeah, I believe that one goes solely after the melanotan 2 and 3, just 3, 3 and 5 maybe. And 4 is the metabolic rate increaser. Okay. Five different melanotan receptors. All right. Okay. One more question. Have you used any of the, besides melanotide, these are PT-141 and I'll look these up, um, set melanotide. What about 5-amino 1-MQ? Yeah. So again, if you can afford it. Is it so expensive? I mean, yeah, to get the dose that you want, which is like 100 to 150 milligrams a day. Okay. It's up there. On top of all this other stuff, I mean, God forbid you're on Anavar too. Like you're, you're going to be- <laughs> thousands a month. Yeah. Um, so that's why I kind of like to lean on the pharmaceutical as much as I can, because we can either get them covered or sampled or, or some other way to really mitigate the, the cost factor with, with all this, um, weight loss journey. But I'll just say my, my biggest combination of stuff is the GLP one slash GIP an SGLT two inhibitor, something like maybe a carbose we can add to it. Um, and then a kind of metabolic burner, like a dihydroberberine, um, either that or, or, or metformin. Um, some of those bitter melon extracts, like the citrus peel kind of formulations can work really well. Um, the kind of liposlim injections with chromium and carnitine and those B vitamins and so forth can help mobilize the fatty acids once they've been released. Not much of a fat burner, but you know, again, they help utilize it from the lymphatics. Let's see, um, thyroid, even if they don't have hypothyroid, you know, just giving them like five or 10 micrograms of T3 can help speed along their metabolism and, uh, and speed along their, their fatigue. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say that's kind of the first principles. Okay. Program. I would think too, like releasing all of this fat, a lot of people will have to be taking liver support because of the obesogens are all stored in fat tissue like all the toxins are stored in fat tissue to have it like come out really quickly i've heard people can just rebound weight gain just from that not when they're on this but just in general like losing weight can make them super toxic yeah well you know it's interesting too because most people you know if i see a high uric acid or triglycerides or the vldl particle numbers or ferritin being high basically indicators are like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease yeah they all substantially get improved. Wow. Yeah. So as far as just improving liver function and, you know, hepatocellular detoxification, like I think using the drug actually has more benefit than even if toxins did get released from the fat to be able to wow. deal with toxicants released. Great. Okay. So let's sum this up, Caleb. You like these things, don't you? Like you, you're finding them extremely useful in your practice. Yeah, they're game. I mean, really, as far as, having something available for people that haven't had something in so long, other than, you know, an intensive surgery and even that kind of having distinct, you know, indistinguishable outcomes. Um, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I feel like it's such a game changer coming from that world of weight loss resistance and being so frustrated with doing everything right. And taking years to get off 10 pounds off my body to have this, I mean, I, I haven't been able to take it, but well, I, I tried, but now I'll, I'll see, I'll try and get it. The nerd tech. I'm going to see if I can't get it up here in Canada, like from the States through somebody. Cause I, I, yeah, just to try it. I feel like I need to give it a solid go. I don't have a ton of weight to lose, but it would just still be, I, I feel like I, I need to experience it fully and to, to, you know, help my clients and, and you took it. Did you, are you still on it then yourself? I take it every now and then. Yeah. 
Yeah. You, so you're just kind of on and off because, okay. Yeah. You don't look like you need to be, but you, you did find that you lost weight on it. Yeah. I mean, it's basically whenever I start to teeter above 10% body fat, I'll take it. Wow. Okay. So how often is that roughly? Uh, like once every six weeks or so. Okay. And then you'll just do like one round, one week, or you'll do a couple weeks, one week. Really? Yeah. Like I think I took it last week and I haven't, haven't needed anything for, it's actually hard to, I mean, I have my protein shakes like ready to go because I know if I don't, I'm going to lose my muscle mass, but it's a, it's a hard sell. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I could, so I could on keep that point, going. I did, I did want to comment on, yes. on that with the lean mass loss because I know there's some pretty um, big yeah. presence, um, concerning uh, lean mass loss. Even with the clients that don't get their protein intake in, and I have their metrics on the ARX machines because I can see progressive overload and their eccentric and concentric contractions, they're getting stronger even though their weight is going down. And even if they're losing lean mass on the DEX or the IQ scan, which is what I have in the office, um, their functional output is not reducing. So for losing weight and increasing their strength, pound for pound, they're actually stronger than they were, even if their lean mass number is decreasing. So I think that's a good distinction to have for people to be armed with in that kind of sense. Just keep track of your numbers. Like what, what kind of lifts are you doing on a normal basis? What did you start with before the drug? What did you end with, you know, in the middle of it? And, um, you know, as long as your strength is improving or you're at least not getting worse, then it doesn't matter if you're losing that lean mass. Do you recommend people to drink the protein shakes and take essential, uh, like branched chain amino acids or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, I would say probably the essentials like, um, what is it? Perfect aminos. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect aminos or something that's, really that's got way. all the essential aminos in it. I'm a big proponent of liver chips just because they're super dense and they give you the iron and stuff that you need when you're not having. Ew, is it really liver like made into chips? They're actually really good. Um, I don't believe you. I gave them to my kids last night just as a joke and they actually liked them. Oh, it's like shit. You guys are expensive now. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it is a good idea though, to supplement with those. Cause I always tell people too, I'm like, make sure you're drinking your shakes. Cause you're, you're going to find that you can't eat enough protein. So you just have something to chew because you don't want to lose your mastication signals. And that's a big, that's a big part of digestion. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think about that either. Okay. So now your practice is full. Sorry, everybody. Cause they're probably all like, yes, I want to get in with this guy, but right now, but you are planning to expand. So possibly taking on new clients in the future, but for right now you do have a Patreon group where people can get information. Like, can, tell us about that. Yeah. So, uh, actually to brush up my own, um, my, my brother started it for me. He's, he's doing all my media and everything. So, um, Basically, all the newsletters and form um, and content that I put out in, in terms of videos and um, shorts and, and, and different conversations that we're going to have and Q and A's and those kinds of things on on the Patreon. So, you know, it's it's kind of my way to reach out to more people than just my membership and to allow for you know the information to get disseminated to more people that need it. Um, but that's an avenue. There's also the Substack that I have for basically the things that I'm doing on a daily basis. That's kind of free. Um, it is free, not kind of free. Um, and that's a newsletter. Yeah. So that's a newsletter that goes out kind of the different tools that I'm using or, or different things that I've been exploring, um, different papers that I've read, just kind of stuff like that. Um, and then the Instagram will kind of be more of a teaser type of uh, tool to kind of do some short stuff, get some, some good information out there. But if you like it, kind of go find the real stuff at Patreon. Right. Okay. Great. I will link to all of that in the show notes so you guys can get direct access to what he's talking about or like go check it out. Thank you, Kayla, very much for coming on the show. And I hope to have you back again because we didn't even explore what you are really passionate about, which is a lot of like neuroscience and PTSD and ketamine use. And oh, I could totally prick your brain on all of that. So I look forward to having you back again. Yeah, Karen. Well, thanks for having me on and uh, thanks for your time.